So this is the second of my lectures on the organelles or the parts of the eukaryotic cell. Um, we finished up with cytoplasmic membrane in the last uh, lecture that I did. Now I'm going to talk about as we get internal into the eukaryotic cell, the organelles that you might find. The first one that I'm going to talk about is the nucleus, and this is the most prominent um, organelle of the eukaryotic cells. It actually has its own membrane around it. It's called a nuclear envelope. It's composed of two membranes that separates it um, from the cytoplasm. And within this structure, this membrane, there are small, regularly spaced pores all around that nucleus. And that allows macromolecules to migrate through the pores to the cytoplasm or from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. Within the nucleus, you would find the nucleolus. This is um, found in the nucleoplasm, the cytoplasm found in the nucleus. Um, it's the site of RNA synthesis, and it's where you would see a collection for all of those ribosomal subunits. Remember, they're made out of rRNA, and so they would be found where RNA is being synthesized. In addition, you should find chromatin, which is the DNA molecule, the long, long string of DNA that is wrapped around histone proteins, and it's obviously the genetic material of the cell. This is a picture of it, so this would show the nucleolus when it, within the big nucleus, that nuclear envelope, and then there's the openings, the nuclear pores. Um, you can't really see the DNA in this one, um, but it's within the nucleus, and this is showing just a picture of it with that nuclear envelope around it. You can see here that attached to that nuclear envelope and really an extension of it is what becomes the endoplasmic reticulum. We'll get into the endoplasmic reticulum next, and it's a series of these microscopic, microscopic tunnels which are used in transport of storage. And um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is different than the smooth, actually has ribosomes which are attached to the membrane surface. So if we go back, you see all these blue dots. These are the ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and make it the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and it allows transport of materials from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and then to the cell's exterior. Um, and once again, it has those ribosomes attached. You will also find smooth endoplasmic reticulum within the cell. Um, it's a closed tubular network and it does not have ribosomes, hence the term smooth instead of rough without the ribosomes. And this is where you would see nutrient processing and often storage of non-protein macromolecules such as lipids. This is a quick picture showing um, the endoplasmic reticulum near the nuclear envelope again, that extension of it. And what it's showing here is that these ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, this is where we have protein synthesis occurring. I'm not going to go into great detail here because we'll get into that in chapter 8. But as these mRNAs are moving through the ribosome, we have a growing polypeptide chain, which is going to become a protein that is being produced from the ribosome and going into that rough endoplasmic reticulum. And what ends up happening is it then will be moved from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. So it will move to the Golgi apparatus, another organelle, which will modify the protein and get it ready to ship it out, either into the cell or outside of the cell. And it has these flattened disc-shaped sacs, which they call cisternae. I often think they look like pancakes. Um, it's always closely associated with endoplasmic reticulum, which makes sense because it's actually taking the protein that was made on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to be modifying those so that they're ready to be used or shipped somewhere else. So what will happen is the endoplasmic reticulum will send some of the protein in a transitional vesicle um, to the Golgi apparatus, and then proteins are modified within the cisternae, and often it's the addition of either sugars and or uh, lipids. These then proteins that have been modified will be pinched off in what is called a condensing vesicle, and they will be transported to either a lysosome or perhaps transported outside of the cell. And this is showing a picture of that. So you have your endoplasmic reticulum, and the transitional vesicles that would have a protein in it that would move here into the cisternae of the Golgi apparatus. They get processed here. 
maybe modified by adding a sugar or a fat, and then they'll be put into a condensing vesicle that can be sent elsewhere in the cell or outside of the cell. So it's kind of an assembly line starting with the nucleus. A segment of that genetic code, remember, in the DNA, which would be in the nucleus, is copied into RNA. That would then go out of the nuclear pores to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Proteins then are synthesized on the rough endoplasmic reticulum by the ribosomes, and they then are deposited inside the endoplasmic reticulum and then transported to the Golgi apparatus. Once they've been packaged and sent to the Golgi apparatus, they're going to be chemically modified and then put into vesicles to be used either inside or outside of the, sh the cell. And this is kind of a, a nice little drawing showing where it all starts. So it starts in the nucleus, that mRNA going out to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, a protein being made, that protein then going to the Golgi apparatus where it gets modified, and then it goes either somewhere into the cell or perhaps out of the cell to be sent somewhere else in either from the organism or if it's a multicellular organism, perhaps to other cells. Um, there's also some vesicles that you will see within a eukaryotic cell. The first one is the lysosomes, and these are um, membranes that have, are kind of a circular membrane that contain enzymes that can be involved in digestion of food particles or perhaps um, protection against invading microorganisms. And they can also help and clean up within the cell if there's damaged tissue or cell debris, they can actually break that down. There are also uh, membrane-bound vacuoles. These are membrane sacs that contain fluids or solid particles um, of different items. They could either be things that need to be digested, so maybe a nutrient that's been taken in by the cell. They could be something that needs to be ex excreted, something that's maybe a waste product the cell wants to get rid of, or stored. So maybe it's a deposit that the cell wants to save until it can use it for another time. And these are formed in phagocytic cells, and that means that they are something that's been engulfed. Um, food or some other substance has been engulfed by the membrane and brought into the cell. The contents of this vacuole then will merge with a lysosome, and it will be digested with the help of some of those uh, enzymes that might be found in lysosome. So if we start up at the top, we have this food particle that maybe a cell comes upon, and it gets engulfed into the cell and it forms a vacuole or a phagosome. And then what happens is it will bond with a lysosome. And when it fuses those enzymes or chemicals that are in the lysosome, then we'll begin to digest the food. And so that's how that works in the eukaryotic cell. Um, we just have a few more of our organelles. The next one is the mitochondria. And this is what we always call the powerhouse of the cell. It's where energy is generated. On the outside of it, it has a smooth and a smooth outer membrane, and then the inside has um, kind of an inner folds called cristae. And this is a quick picture. This is the outer smooth membrane, and inside you can see this cristae. And on this cristae, it's going to be where there are enzymes and electron carriers that will help in aerobic respiration, which is a way that the the mitochondria can take oxygen and actually make energy. So it can extract chemical energy contained in nutrient molecules and stores it as ATP when there's oxygen present. Um, it's very unique in the sense that it divides, number one, independently of the cell. Number two, it contains circular strands of DNA. And number three, it has a prokaryotic sized 70S ribosome. So hopefully this should be ringing a bell to you that this sounds an awful lot like a prokaryotic cell. As a matter of fact, that's what researchers have often have believe is how the mitochondria came to be in a eukaryotic cell. It's that it perhaps was a bacterial cell or a prokaryotic cell that was taken in by this eukaryotic organism and used because it's great at producing energy. So this is a picture of it here. You can see this is kind of what the picture looks like with the cristae. And then this is kind of the cartoon molecule. And we have those ribosomes that are the 70S that resemble the prokaryotic cell. And we have also the DNA molecule here that's circular. Um, in addition, we have 
So let me backtrack. All of these ones that I've just talked about are going to be found in all eukaryotic cells. Chloroplast, which is the next one I'd like to talk about, is actually only found in some eukaryotic cells. It's found in algae and plant cells. And what chloroplasts can do is they can convert energy from the sun into a chemical energy, and it's through the process of photosynthesis. And in the process of photosynthesis, the byproduct or what comes off when photosynthesis occurs is oxygen. So we think of that with plants that they can produce oxygen that then other organisms can use. They look similar to a mitochondria, but they're larger and they contain special pigments. And it's the pigments that have um, aid them in converting that sunlight into energy. Uh, ribosomes, we've talked about this a little bit. This is going to be in all cells. They're distributed throughout the cell. They're um, in the cytoplasm and the cytoskeleton. They're also uh, associated with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And both mitochondria and chloroplasts have ribosomes within them. They can be found in short chains, which then are termed polyribosomes. And in a eukaryotic cell, so this is when we're talking about the eukaryotic ribosomes, they are large and they have these small subunits of ribonucleoprotein. And they are an ADS. Remember prokaryote were 70S. These are ADS and they're a combination of a 60S and 40S subunit. But this once again is where we would see protein synthesis occurring. That's the function of the ribosome. We also have the cytoskeleton. We talked about this in the prokaryotic cell and it has very similar uh, functions in a eukaryotic cell. It anchors the organelles, which is a little bit different since only eukaryotic cells have organelles. And it can move the RNA and vesicles, but it also helps in permitting shape changes and in movement. And um, there are three types of cytoskeletal elements. There's the actin filaments, which are made up of protein. We also have microtubules and we have intermediate filaments. And when we look at this uh, view, you can see they're a scaffolding or a framework that the cell has. So these intermediate filaments here may be holding the Golgi apparatus in place. We also have microtubules, which may be helping in transport. Um, and then we have actin filaments, and these really are the structural supports that help uh, maintain the shape of the cell. Um, this last diagram is in your book, and hopefully this gives you a chance to compare uh, the comparison of cells and viruses. So we have bacterial and archaeal cells um, with eukaryotic cells and then viruses. As we've said, viruses don't really fall into the category of a cell and it's because they are missing many of these major um, functions or structures. And those might include genetics, reproduction, biosynthesis, respiration, photosynthesis, motility, shape, and then complexity of function. Um, and then we also have the size. So hopefully this gives you a great summary on that. And um, if you have any questions, let me know.